And this is Dr. Arthur Perry, and I'm going to talk for just a minute before our guest comes in about the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Now, many of you know that I have been affiliated with Robert Wood Johnson for, I can't believe, it's been uh, maybe almost 28 years, about 27 and a half years, and happily affiliated. Robert Wood Johnson is my primary teaching, uh, my primary hospital where I operate. It is the primary teaching hospital for the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, now part of Rutgers. It used to be uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, and that's now part of Rutgers. Now, Robert Wood Johnson is a comprehensive teaching hospital in uh, the center of the state. And what that means is virtually every single specialty is represented at Robert Wood Johnson, everything from dentistry to podiatry, to internal medicine, cardiology, cardiac surgery. And today's guest, we're going to be talking about neurosurgery. And yes, of course, plastic surgery also at the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Now, there's a few of them now. They've opened up the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in Somerset to complement the facility that's been in New Brunswick for many, many years. Now, they have a great website at Robert Wood Johnson, and it is rwjuh.edu. That's rwjuh.edu. If you go to that website, you can learn, and you can stay on this thing for hours because it's almost endless. You can learn about every medical issue and every medical problem you would like to learn about. And you can also check out any physician who is affiliated with either of the two Robert Wood Johnson hospitals, either Somerset or New Brunswick. So uh, check out rwjuh.edu, and if you want to call them up, 888-MD-RWJUH. That's 888-MD-RWJUH. All right, we're back. This is Dr. Arthur Perry, and uh, tonight we've got a great guest from the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. We've got Dr. Garav Gupta, and he is the uh, director of the Cerebrovascular and Endovascular Neurosurgery uh, Program at Robert Wood Johnson. Dr. Gupta, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking time on this weekend, this uh, holiday weekend in the New York area, and uh, it's very kind of you to take time on your Saturday evening to tell us about brain aneurysm diagnosis and advancements in the treatment. Boy, I'll tell you, with the sudden death of that uh, eyewitness news reporter, that was uh, Lisa Caligrassi, uh, about a week or so ago from a brain aneurysm at age 49, doctors, including myself, have been receiving a lot of calls from patients uh, about brain aneurysms, and they're wondering, you know, how can they protect themselves? What do they do? So uh, that's why we brought you in. Dr. Gupta is an expert on this topic. He's uh, the director of the, uh, I'll say it again because these are big words, the Cerebrovascular and Endovascular Neurosurgery Program at Robert Wood Johnson. So now, Dr. Gupta, this was a shocking development with, uh, with that news reporter. Tell us, how common is this? Um, Dr. Perry, you're absolutely right. It was indeed shocking um, that at such a young age, um, and a bright career that Lisa had. Uh, she was uh, uh, taken away from us uh, from a devastating disease. Um, first of all, uh, my prayers and on behalf of the Rutgers uh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and Hospital, um, our condolences go to the entire family um, um, of uh, Ms. Caligrassi. Um, uh, it was definitely devastating. Now, regarding the question you asked, how common is it? Um, in the United States, roughly about 6 million people have a brain aneurysm, uh, accounts to about 1 in 50 people, meaning about 2% of the population has brain aneurysms. Now, out of those 6 million patients, only about 1% or about 30,000 people in the United States will rupture every year, meaning something like one brain aneurysm rupture every 18 minutes. Um, they're fatal in about 40 to 45 percent cases, and those who survive, about 60 to 70 percent, about four out of seven patients will have permanent neurological deficit. Now, worldwide, that's about 500,000 deaths every year from brain aneurysms. Well, that's uh, that's uh, an enormous number of people. Now, so now, everybody listening is saying, well, uh, you know, maybe. I have a brain aneurysm. You know, what what are the symptoms? Uh, you know, what what should people know about, and, and how can they prevent this from happening to them? Um, so, um, a two part question: um, um, 
what are the symptoms of brain aneurysms. Um, uh, the presence of a brain aneurysm may not be known until it ruptures. So there can be, uh, so the symptoms can be uh, from an unruptured brain aneurysm, which are quite different from a ruptured brain aneurysm. If it is unruptured, then you can have headaches, which will be different from your regular headaches. Everybody gets a headache. I get a headache, sometimes sinusitis, dental pain, migraine. But the um, headaches from brain aneurysms are different. They can have pressure symptoms from the actual aneurysm, which could be eye pain. They could have visual symptoms. Now, if the aneurysm has ruptured, then the most important take-home point from today's talk would be anybody experiencing the worst headache of life, thunderclap headache, saying this is different from my usual headaches, that's the most important symptoms. They can also have nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, um, loss of consciousness. So but the most important symptom is the worst headache of life, as people describe as 10 out of 10. All right, so let's say someone has that worst headache. Now, what do they do? Uh, Robert Wood Johnson has a center with you at it. How important is it to go to you or a hospital such as uh, Robert Wood Johnson as opposed to, you know, a facility that doesn't have uh, what you have and might have to transfer you? Tell us about that. Um, in all honesty, as much as I am proud of the institution that I work at, <clears throat> uh, if a patient suffers from the worst headache of life, they should go to the nearest emergency room. Um, and almost all emergency rooms are equipped to take care of the initial symptoms of the brain aneurysm. And after that, um, they, um, if they do find that it is indeed, they confirm the presence of bleeding in the brain from a brain aneurysm, they should transfer to a higher center, for example, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Now, why a higher center? Um, um, uh, the reason being that it really takes a large, highly skilled, multidisciplinary team of physicians um, um, uh, taking, to take care of uh, the diagnosis of brain aneurysms. You need a neurosurgeon, um, you need an interventional neuroradiologist, you need a stroke neurologist, a very highly skilled ICU team, not only for the actual diagnosis and treatment, but for the aftercare of the aneurysms as well. Now, also important is the pediatric brain aneurysms. Uh, we do have a, a large pediatric hospital, the Bristol Myers Squibbs Children Hospital, and that's a nationally recognized pediatric academic program where we take care of pediatric aneurysms, pediatric AVMs, and a large number of multidisciplinary uh, pediatric neurosurgeons, pediatric neurointerventional radiologists, uh, critical care specialists. So it's very important, I must specify, a multidisciplinary team of highly skilled people. And that's great information. Dr. Garuf Gupta, the uh, director of the Cerebrovascular and Endovascular Neurosurgery Department at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Great information about aneurysms, and uh, we're in a new era of treating these aneurysms. And neurosurgeons like you, Dr. Gupta, you're saving lives every day, and I want to thank you for being at Robert Wood Johnson and, and having the program there. So, Thanks so much again for, uh, for being on the show this Saturday evening. This is Dr. Arthur Perry, and uh, you've been listening to What's Your Wrinkle and uh, a very special session tonight about uh, aneurysms. If you've got...